the fourth session continues to use positive skills and specifically using the PREMAC principle to increase behavior. Again, what this, this session focuses on is continuing to use the skills, reviewing homework, um, presenting the concept that children get a lot of attention for being disruptive and that they need attention for their non-disruptive behavior. Um, going through ways and, and modalities of paying attention to independent behavior, introducing the PREMAC principle, um, and then practicing increasing kids' independence and good behavior during busy times. So let me elaborate on this. So the goals of the session specifically are to review the implementation of special time using the verbal rewarding and ignoring skills, so basically what we went over at the end of yesterday. Uh, two, to review and extend the use of attending and rewarding skills for catching your child being good. To increase this use by parents of effective attending and awarding skills for kids during independent, non-disruptive activities. And finally, to train parents to use the PREMAC principle to encourage independent activities. So the reason why this session was chosen and put into our parent training session lineup in this order is because many children um, seek attention from their parents, as we discussed thoroughly yesterday. And they want attention and they oftentimes will seek attention in a variety of avenues. And oftentimes when kids have had coercive cycles develop, they're seeking attention through, the, through negative behaviors or they're doing things to try to solicit attention from their parents. So what we had worked on in the past two sessions was um, teaching parents how when behavior happens and attention is given, that behavior is likely to increase, regardless of whether that behavior is positive or that behavior is negative. So we started having families introduce the concept of attending or paying attention during activities. Um, and that had two benefits, one of increasing the parent-child relationship, but then secondly, it naturally in and of itself would reinforce the behavior happening during playtime. So when kids are doing something nice, and attention's provided to it, we're likely going to reinforce whatever was happening when attention was provided. But that doesn't change that many kids will still try to solicit attention from their parents, and they do that through um, interrupting their activities or being disruptive during times where parents can't pay attention to them. And that oftentimes is a complaint that we hear from families is that, you know, it, they're starting to shift into a model where they're feeling a bit consumed by the amount of attention that they're having to devote to their kids to maintain that good behavior. So we want to take those same principles of developing a good relationship, catching your child being good, labeled praise, to start to teach kids how to sustain um, activity independently. And so the point of this session is to teach parents how to not only continue that positive relationship building, but then to strategically use some of those skills to start to lengthen the period of time that their kids can do things independently. Now, again, I know we were asked, I was asked yesterday to make sure where we include um, how to apply this to an adolescent setting. And adolescents certainly have a larger capacity for independent activity than a younger child does. And so well, what we'll want to strategically do when implementing the strategy with adolescents is to look for times where the adolescent may naturally struggle or do some attention seeking for the parent or even just starting to acknowledge the independence that the adolescent already has and letting them know that that's something we want to see maintain over time. So what we'll be doing in this session is teaching parents to continue with those attending skills but then to strategically start to prep their kids for times when they're going to have to sustain their own attention or they're going to have to keep themselves independent and active without the parent being there. And so we'll have the parents introduce that concept that there are going to be times where mom's busy or dad's busy or grandma's busy and these are what my expectations are of you during those times. And even go through and practice some fake busy times with the kids where they say, you know, for the next 10 minutes I I can't, interrupt, I can't have you interrupt me. We're going to be doing something. So when those real occasions arise, the child's had some practice in doing so. But what we teach parents is um, to 
provide levels of attention or reinforcement during that independent time and start to space out the intervals of attention that they give. So let me take this back and explain more what I mean. We'll teach parents to identify a set period of time that they'll practice with their child, be it five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour for an older child, and say that they're gonna be engaging in something quite independent or quite important and they can't have frequent interruptions. So planning ahead with a child, what can you do to keep yourself busy? Um, what are some things if you have a question, how can you let me know in a respectful way or in a way that's not gonna interrupt? So to plan ahead with a child for how they're gonna handle this independent time. And then what we're teaching the parents to do is to leave their, not leave their kids entirely, not leave the house, but leave the immediate vicinity of their kids, but strategically come back in during intervals to say, I really like that you're playing so nicely by yourself, you're doing a great job helping me. Or to come in and say, when I come in and wink at you, that means I'm really proud of what a great job you're doing. And so to start coming in at, at somewhat high frequency intervals to say, oh, you just got your wink, your thumbs up, you're doing a great job playing nicely, and practice that and then start to stretch out those intervals for longer and longer periods of time so that the child knows that they're continuing to do a good job. We'll also work with parents to do some <coughs> contingency planning. So to set up, you know, if the child has done a good job of playing independently or entertaining themselves independently, what is it that they can earn for their efforts? And again, by earning something, it doesn't have to be something tangible or expensive, but could they possibly earn parent time or could they earn something else to acknowledge that they succeeded in that goal that we've been working on with parents. So we'll get into the mechanics of how to do this, but at a very introductory level, does that skill make sense to people? Is there anything that I can clarify? Okay. The pre-MAC principle then is the second thing that we aim to teach parents during this session and to work into their, their behavioral repertoire. And what the pre-MAC principle is, is putting a more desired or reinforcing activity after a less reinforcing or desired activity. So many parents will use the phrase of when then, which is a um, kind of a, a remembering device for what the pre-MAC principle is. So when you do your homework, then you can have dessert. Or when you finish dinner, then you can have dessert. But you don't have to use that, pra that phrase to essentially be employing the pre-MAC principle. The pre-MAC principle is allowing a more desired or reinforcing activity or item or entity to occur after a less reinforcing uh, event. And so we'll teach parents how to use that concept in application of increasing kids' independent time. Okay, so let's get through some of the nuts and bolts of this. Um, in our ABC model, again, we'll bring back the parents that the consequence is attending, but we're gonna specifically be doing it during independent activities. So paying positive attention to the child during their independent time in an effort to increase their ability to function independently. Uh, we're going to focus on how parents can use their attending and rewarding skills to reinforce children for independent activity. So as I just somewhat explain. Prior to starting their own activity, the parent needs to get the child started on some independent activity of their own, and the parents should clearly communicate the expectation to the child that the child's remain engaged in his project while the parent's doing their activity. Periodically, the parent should look up from their activity and briefly attend and re reward the child's activity. So essentially starting to specifically integrate attention during independent activities, and then we'll work on lengthening that interval, so going from two, three minutes to five minutes to 10 minutes onward. How this likely translates to an adolescent audience, we can see how this really fits in nicely for younger children um, and the developmental considerations we make for even preschool age children is they do need to learn how to independently play. Just our intervals may change and our expectations of what the kids can do um, will be lower than what we would expect of a seven-year-old. But oftentimes the type of activities that parents have the developmental expectation for teens to do are things like being able to clean their room independently, to do their homework independently, to do the chores around the house independently, to entertain themselves independently. And adolescents are naturally emerging into a period of their life where they 
seem to want more autonomy and independence. So certainly entertaining themselves independently is a skill that they have um, that they're more naturally acquiring. Though there are still some adolescents that struggle with that. But where the application of this may be most relevant is teaching parents, you know, if you have done the groundwork of the parent of reestablishing that relationship and having the parents start to re-engage with their child and even though, you know, adolescents kind of naturally reject what their parents are doing anyway, to start to make parents' attention and involvement something that the adolescent is going to find reinforcing, we can apply this concept to a more developmentally appropriate event for adolescents. So if a parent wants the adolescent to be able to work independently and not get off task, so to trust that they can leave them for an extended period of time to complete a series of chores or commands or to complete homework, we have the parents strategically come back in during those activities to assess, is it happening? Are they doing that independent activity? And still offering praise statements and encouragement along the way. And then taking that same model of lengthening the intervals of time that they need to go in and check in on their adolescent as the adolescent becomes more successful. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? OK. Can I say, uh, oh, please. with areas, I think it could also work pretty good, is the pre-adolescent pre plus the teen who are experiencing peer issues. Mm -hmm. And where the parent is going to try and take this time to do skills, um, skills training, develop self-esteem, strengths, you mm -hmm. know, identifying with them. Yeah, can you tell me a little bit more about how you see this applying? Most times working, you know, with um, pre-adolescents and the teens, with the pain, going into schools, been in the different schools, mm -hmm. addressing, working with, and where they are, they feel that sense of rejection. Mm -hmm. And it's, it affects every aspect of their being. You have to really approach your self-esteem area and try to get there and to build that. Mm -hmm. And then that extends out into the, these comments. When they feel strong within themselves, know who they are, at least, to mm -hmm. try and know and build on that. And you work, I think, most time in the homes, I go in the homes too, and help the parent to mm -hmm. do that. And most times, the difficulty, especially with the teens and the mm -hmm. parents, is to get back that bonding with the parent, mm -hmm. that relationship building. Mm -hmm. And once you start to establish someone, they have somebody they trust, somebody mm -hmm. they know, maybe mean them well, not just in the school, you know, where the or teens, then they start to respond. Yep. You can really, I call it program their minds, you know, mm -hmm. with good stuff, you know, yep. you're good, you're very good at playing whatever it is, you are strong, you are this yep. and then. You move on with them. You, you, they build that yeah. back with the parent, and they turn to the parent. So I'm hearing a couple of things that you're saying that I think are really important. One, just the general attending skills with an adolescent is just as important as attending skills with a younger child. But the other thing, uh, other two things I heard you say was that, um, you know, oftentimes, particularly as kids get older, there's some natural reticence to, to praise them the same way or in the same frequency, the same intensity, which is, which is natural. Kids are aging. They find some of our, our things we would have used in the past to be too babyish or too immature. Um, but instead of modifying the way we're interacting with teens, we sometimes have a tendency just to withdraw, which can contribute to that course of cycle. So I think I'm hearing you what you say is just going in strategically and intentionally during activities that they need to do independently and just providing more frequent acknowledgement of their efforts and your pride in them and that you can see that they're working towards a goal will have an effect on their self-esteem. But it's also something like what you're saying is that for some of our kids, they're struggling or they're impaired in multiple areas. So at school, in their peer relationships, in their home relationship. And so even bolstering their self-esteem in one domain, like doing homework, or in the home setting may help to generalize their feelings of self-efficacy to other domains of their life. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that's an assumption we're making, but it might be an assumption worth trying out with some families. And I would reckon for some families that's going to be the case. For other teens it may not be the case, but it, it's something that we can work as a guide with our families to figure out if we are strategically increasing the child's feeling of independence and autonomy in one area, will that generalize to other areas? Yeah, I was struck as you were talking about using the, you know, the checking in mm -hmm. that sort of things as a way of, with teens, a way for computer time, a 
really got to teach parents. Mm -hmm. you know, Yep. Or they harass them so yep. badly that someone to talk to them. Giving yep. them the skill of how to, how to really do that and help the yep. child. And in some ways, increasing independence or autonomy is going to look different in our different developmental ages. So in younger kids, teaching them independent play and independent activity is a skill in and of itself. You're right, for some of our older kids and our teens, they can entertain themselves. That's not the problem. In fact, getting them off of the computer is the problem. But they need to learn independence and autonomy in other areas, like following through with directions, completing a set of chores, completing homework. And so, right. and so taking this approach and applying it to the areas where the teen is struggling, not necessarily just getting them to play independently. They're, they're usually pretty proficient at, at, at that. OK. So again, does this, do, are these concepts making sense so far? OK. Um, again, as I mentioned, the pre-MAC principle is a special case of reinforcement that can also be used to reward children or teens for more independent behavior. And pre-MAC principle states that a high probability behavior can be used to reinforce a low probability behavior. Example, like a when-then. So the high likelihood of reinforcement or the high probability of something happening, like a children, child saying yes to wanting dessert, is used to motivate a lower frequency behavior or a lower likelihood behavior, like getting homework done. So again, it's one implementation strategy for increasing independent time. So yes, I'm going to be checking in with you frequently during homework and letting you know I'm proud of your efforts, that you're making progress, that you're sustaining what you're doing. In addition, I might offer a when-then statement. And when this is all done, then we can do something that has a higher probability of eliciting that behavior that I want to see. Okay. And the homework then for parents is to attend, reward, and use their pre-MAC principle to teach children how to engage in independent behavior commit to doing two to three projects this week, projects intentionally being prescribed, pre-chosen things that the parent's going to do to practice the skill with the child, not necessarily times where they are busy. So they'll say, I have something very important to do, but in actuality, what they're doing may not be that important. It's just the opportunity for them to practice this skill. And then they're going to use the attending skills, the labeled praise skills, the physical rewarding skills, the catching the child being good skills that they have learned in previous sessions and applying all of those concepts in, with the intent to lengthen the child's independent time or autonomy. Okay. So far, is session four making, making sense? Do people feel like they want to practice some of session four's content? In some ways, it is quite similar to what we went over yesterday. So, yeah. Does this program have video clips that go with it where parents can really see the behavior? It doesn't have video clips. And so, again, let, let me um, refresh this uh, series of sessions. What it is is it's a modification of the parenting programs that were used during the MTA study. And the MTA study was the largest study of children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and they compared medication to psychosocial treatment to a combination of that to nothing. And so for kids that receive psychosocial treatment, they received many different types of psychosocial treatment, but all children received a parenting program. So about a decade ago is when this specific parenting program was developed and it was developed with a lot of different investigators, including Bill Pelham, Howard Abacoff, Karen Wells, others who were involved in that process. And they systematically reviewed the parenting literature to do just what we did, pull out the commonalities, to look at what the effective ingredients were. And what we've done for today is to update that, to update that based on some current studies that have come out, other parenting programs, and then also to take out some of the study-specific protocols that were in that parenting uh, manual. And really, it is intended to be a flexible, uh, non-commercial or generic behavioral parent training program. So include the aspects of most behavioral parent training programs. Uh, it's developed in a social learning theory context, but it's meant to be um, an exportable, flexible manual with components to, to shape kids' behavior. So because it's not a commercially available product, meaning we're not selling it, 
there aren't any accompanying videos that go with it. Now for many of the commercial programs that exist, there are some really fantastic videos. So um, I know Chuck Cunningham's program, COPE, they have videos um, and videotapes of exaggerated parenting errors that parents can watch and identify what some of those errors are. There are also videos that go along with the Incredible Years series. So if you work with another series or want to integrate videos, I don't see them as incompatible with this, but that would be a segment that you're adding. There's not an accompanying video set for this. And you had a question? Mm -hmm. In terms of the parents, I think I mentioned it to you yesterday when we left. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the parents that I would implement something like this with, yep. they would be a low socioeconomic, low functioning. Mm -hmm. And to grasp these concepts, something like a video, mm -hmm. to show them literally yep. concrete, okay, this is what needs to be done, mm -hmm. and explaining it all, mm -hmm. I don't know if they understand mm -hmm. um, all the concepts like that. Is, um, I don't know if it's possible for them to just. Uh, present this in a way also and talk about sure. how to share this with parents mm -hmm. and not even changing the vocabulary of it, but really like you're almost in a sense forgetting theory and just here's what mm -hmm. you did very, very yep. formal type, so. and, and I do recognize that there's going to be a bit of translation from what's presented in this training to what you're going to do with parents because my job is to teach you the theoretical rationale behind why some of these strategies are in place or what's the behavior change that, that we would expect. And so I tend to speak um, you know, more on a professional level. Yeah, and, and I, I know you understand that. With parents, yes, yeah, certainly we don't necessarily have to give them the level of detail and rationale. And for much of these exercises, for working with families that, let's say, have lower cognitive functioning, just like it might take kids with lower cognitive functioning more repetitions and more exposure and more intensity to learn a skill, they can still learn a skill. Their learning curve does not look the same as a typically developing child's learning curve, but it is a learning curve none the same. And same thing with adults. Our learning curves are going to look different based upon our knowledge base, our capacity for for learning a new skill, for implementing it. So when you're making modifications, for instance, for a family that's uh, lower functioning or, or has uh, lower cognitive skills, again, there is some assessment that goes in to determine what level of information we're going to give them. But really, um, perhaps de-emphasizing the theoretical rationale behind why we're doing these strategies and more direct information about this is the strategy to use for this behavior and let's practice it. And our role plays aren't going to be limited to one or two role plays in session with feedback, um, but are going to be uh, saturated with many role plays. And we may take a single concept, stretching it over a couple of sessions, and looking at reaching mastery with those parents rather than just introducing the concept and letting them practice it at home. The other thing that you'll probably want to integrate with families that are of lower cognitive functioning is far more modeling on your part than just talking through it with them. So I'm gonna model how to do when then. I'm gonna model how to do independent time with your child. And now I'm gonna have you do what I did. And along the way I'm gonna say, that's a really good job because you're doing this. You really are doing this nicely and that's just what I told you to do, that was great. And to really look at their behavior just as we would look at a child's behavior or anyone's behavior in terms of success of approximation. Are they getting closer to the goal or to the implementation of the behaviors that we would want to see? And so I think in general the largest modification that you're going to make is more modeling and more practice and more practice to mastery rather than just exposure to practice in session and then now go home and try it with your kids and let's figure out was this a skill that worked for you. So that's the largest modification that I see. Fewer, less explanation, probably fewer handouts of the theoretical rationale, and more saturated practice to mastery. But let me open it up, because I've given my two cents, but I'd like to hear from others. If you're using this program, or sessions of this program, with families that are of lower functioning, lower cognitive functioning, what might be some modifications that you see as important to make? Yes. Mm -hmm. We have an intensive five-week program where parents come every day. And they, um, the whole philosophy behind the program is to bring joy to the family and then through joy to create opportunities for change and education. So we do that in many different ways. We include the siblings in our activities. Grandparents, aunts, uncles are invited if they're 
So it sounds like the elements of what I'm hearing you say make it successful. And I'm going to take the, the access to a dolphin out of it, because I realize that's not something that all of us have access to. But what I'm, hearing you, what I'm hearing you say is that you bring in multiple social supports. So it's not just limited to one caregiver, but it's open to multiple caregivers. And so many people are getting on the same page at once. It sounds like you offer a really highly enriching environment. And so making some of the activities and the practice that parents are doing naturally fun and enticing, both for them and for the kids, helps to sustain the motivation to make some of these changes. And that's one of the things mm -hmm. that we work on is we do say, you know, you can't do dolphins something you don't know dolphins. Yeah. Like, oh, mm-hmm. And very similar to yeah. spending quality time Yeah. Yeah. So we wow them in the environment, show them that some things that should can occur, mm -hmm. and then as it should occur, having them sustain it. Yeah. And it sounds like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And it sounds like the other thing that you do is you offer extended practice opportunities for the parents that are supervised activities. So not that the parent can't do it, but you give them a lot of opportunities for naturalistic things to come up with therapist support there to say, this is how to handle it, or great, you handled it this way. This is what I think the long-term impact is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm glad. I think it's, yeah, it, it's great that this forum offers so many opportunities for us to meet and make connections within our community. And I think the other important thing that I'm hearing you saying is that you're thinking about how to take elements um, and really aspects of social learning theory and applying them in different settings that are going to be palatable for your families. And, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, when talking about the modifications that we're going to make for early childhood or for adolescents or for families with developmental delays, it sounds like people are really spending time thinking about how to adjust the implementation of these strategies to better fit the population with whom we work while still honoring, in, in some respect, the social learning theory, what's going to change the behavior, what's going to propel learning. I know that you had a your hand just as far as you know, one of the things for the lowest socioeconomic or the other, mm -hmm. I really do think your group study works a whole lot yep. better than Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a question I had yesterday is do we know if there are differences in terms of applicability between group setting and individual session setting? And there has been some work into this. Um, and specifically researchers that have done use social marketing tools to look at what do parents prefer and then contrasting that to treatment outcome studies which where do parents do better and it looks like there are um, when you look at different segments of the population that most people initially indicate that they probably prefer individual sessions um, but when you look at behavioral parent training studies that have been done looking at a group format versus an individual format in terms of the skills they acquire, they, they look relatively comparable, but in group settings, we see parents have better attendance and complete more sessions. So it's probably what's happening is there's some social pressure to continue, or you're, you're making social supports, you're meeting people in your community, you're meeting people who have um, similar situations that, as your own. Um, so we see a little less dropout in group settings and, and more treatment completion, um, though I think most people would prefer an individual treatment modality when you ask them outright, would you rather come to a group or would you rather just come in and talk about your family? I'd rather just come in and talk about my family and work on my family, but in terms of, of appeal and, and outcomes, it, there doesn't seem to be a reason not to do, to do group unless you know, there's some practical limitations. Um, and I'm saying this generally. There are many, many studies out there which all have slightly, slightly different outcome findings. But um, generally, that has been, been my find of the, the scientific literature on, on those types of variables. So anyway, I'm going to um, move on for a moment to session five. And what I'd like to do is introduce the content of session five 
before we take our first break. And then we come back, actually do some practice on session five. And session five and session six are very closely aligned. Session five really focuses on teaching parents how to give more effective instructions or directions or commands. So what are some of the mechanics that make instructions, effect, instructions effective? And then the next session, session six, is focused on how to do timeout effectively. So we're transitioning from um, more antecedent-based strategies or reinforcement-based strategies into now more punishment-based strategies and, and timeout being a punishment-based strategy. So again, I'm going to introduce session five. When we come back from break, we'll kind of get into the mechanics of how to teach parents that and what some of the, the activities are that you would do during session, and then we'll transition into timeouts, okay? All right, so for giving effective commands to children, establishing behavioral rules and rewarding compliance, this is the intent of the next session. And again, what we're going to do is review the homework from the previous session, go through where this fits in on our ABC chart, and then get into the specifics of how to do this. And really, the intent of behavioral rules and giving effective commands is to increase compliance because parents might be working on many, reducing many different negative disruptive behaviors and increasing many positive pro-social behaviors, one commonality that we often see across families that are coming for, for parenting classes is that their children don't readily follow their instructions or their commands or their children are non-compliant. It feels like there's either a passive or an active resistance to whatever it is they're trying to get their child to do. And so we want to teach them assessing for compliance, and then rewarding compliance when it occurs, or giving a direction, seeing if the child follows it, and then following through with acknowledging that they followed the direction. Okay, so in our ABC chart, we're really talking about several things here. We're talking both about a consequence as well as an antecedent. So the consequence is specifically starting to acknowledge or reward compliance when it happens. Compliance being following the directions of a command, an instruction, or a direction. So teaching parents how to explicitly notice when their kids have done what they say they are to do and to acknowledge that and to work on providing attention and labeled praise after that behavior occurs so as to reinforce that behavior, specifically compliance. So the B in your ABC model here would be compliance, the C being attention for complying. We're also teaching them several antecedents, specifically how to give good instruction or good direction or good commands. And then thirdly, how to set up behavioral rules or expectations. So stating their expectations ahead of time so that the kids know what they are um, so as to increase the likelihood of kids following those rules or complying with what parents say to do. So there's essentially three different components that we're teaching in this one session. Again, if you have families that are, are of uh, lower cognitive functioning, just like in session three where we were practicing attending, verbal reward, physical reward, and planned ignoring, that might be a lot of skills for one session and, and a lot to master. And so you may strategically decide to cover one or maybe two of those skills in a session assess for mastery, introduce the next couple skills, assess for mastery. So you may spend a long time on certain, certain sessions. And this may be a session that some parents get readily, 
but we may start first with just one session on establishing behavioral rules and then another session on how to implement those rules at home and then start to integrate how to do a good command. And for some families, it may be less important for them to identify a poor command, but really just to get saturated practice of good commands. And so just doing more of the practice and saying, no, say it this way, and practicing online rather than identifying why was that command poor. For other families, the knowledge of, of oh, that's a bad command because X, Y, and Z, when it happens naturalistically, during their life, then they can start to say, oh, I actually phrased that as a question, or oh, I phrased it this way, and that's not likely to elicit compliance. So you're gonna have to make some choices about the way you present this material and the kind of intensity in which you present this material to your families. We're also, as we start talking about timeout, we'll make modifications for what to do for an adolescent, because timeout for an adolescent seems to be less socially appealing to families, though, the rationale of would it work probably is the same, but we can talk about modifications to make. Um, and then also for younger kids, what are modifications to make with a timeout? But again, that's session six. We'll get there in just a second. Okay. So one thing that we're going to emphasize to families in this session is the importance of compliance. And again, many families may have identified compliance or following directions as one of the behaviors that they want to see increase and may have identified non-compliance or not listening to instructions as one of the behaviors that they want to see decrease. But oftentimes, this is a source of frustration to parents that they don't readily identify and is continuing to be a source of frustration up through this point in time that we're working with them. And so the next couple sessions really focus on teaching kids to be better at following directions. And one of the reasons why that's a skill we explicitly teach and why it's important is that um, kids who are not compliant um, really can create a strong source of stress for their families, can contribute to a negative family climate and to a negative, negative home client. And following a, adult instructions is a skill that's important for, you know, teens, preteens, kids, um, toddlers to learn how to do because not following adult directions is something that's going to negatively impact their life in multiple domains. So if you're not good at following directions from your parent and from your teacher and from other adults in your life, you're going to have disruptive relationships in multiple domains. So again, here, what our hope is, is by increasing compliance in one setting, there will be some generalization of that skill over time to other settings, okay? And one of the major components of of attending and rewarding compliance is making families actively practice doing that via role play in session and then active practice in the home session. So this is one of those sessions where the content, it's kind of easy to get lured into. We don't need to practice this so much, parents get it. But in terms of implementation, parents need quite a bit of practice of identifying they followed my direction and I need to specifically make note of that for them and specifically praise compliance or specifically attend to compliance to increase the likelihood of it occurring in the future. Um, I'm gonna skip this for a second and come back to it. We're also going to be teaching parents the difference between giving good instructions and poor instructions and doing this with examples. So we're gonna go through first together as a group what constitutes a poor instruction. This is in your handout, but I'm also gonna distribute a handout with that information in it for you, and it's also on, on your manual. But things that constitute a poor instruction. And what, the reason why we're calling them a poor instruction or a bad instruction is because we know from doing observational studies of, of families that these types of directions are less likely to yield compliance, meaning kids are less likely to follow through with the directions given if they're given this way than if they are given in a, in a good command format. And so again, the reason why we introduce these concepts to parents is not because we expect them to hear it and change their behavior right away, but we want to make sure they understand why these are bad commands, why they're less likely to result in compliance, so they can start to increase their awareness of how frequently they're doing them, or when they're doing them, or how to modify doing them. 
So a buried instruction is essentially talking too much. So if you want your child to go take their shoes upstairs to their room, a buried instruction might be, I need you to take your stuff upstairs. Your shoes are always here on the bottom of the floor. I've told you a thousand times. I want you to pick them up and take them upstairs. And on the way, I want you to take anything else that you see, and I don't want your shoes down here any longer. So, and you know, that, that's, how a lot of, that's how we all talk to our kids in some ways, and how a lot of parents talk to our kids. And it, in and of itself, in one instance, it's not ex implicitly wrong. It's not going to ruin a kid forever if you give a buried command. But if our intent is to start to increase following directions in kids or increase compliance, we want to make sure we're setting them up for success. And if a parent gives a direction this way, does it mean the kid doesn't have to follow it? No, but what it means is our antecedent might be influencing compliance. If it wasn't clear to the kid or the child stopped listening after five seconds of, how many times do I have to tell you? Then we're less likely to elicit the behavior that we want to see. So we'll help parents to identify what a buried command is. So when they hear themselves start to do it, they can say, I just need to say, pick up your shoes and take them upstairs. That's really what I mean. A chain instruction is, I want you to pick up your shoes, take them upstairs. On the way, I want you to pick up anything that's on the stairs and head onto your room, and I want your room cleaned. Or giving multiple directions in one step. Again, it's something that's commonly done. And the danger in this type of instruction, why it leads to noncompliance, is that either there are so many directions given to the child that they don't even engage in any of them, or they do maybe one, but they don't do all three. And then it's they're getting in trouble for not following directions. And really, they made some overture of effort, or they tried to be compliant. They just didn't get to all of them or forgot one of them along the way. So teaching parents, specifically for younger kids, giving one-step directions at a time. If they have the kids to have any slight development till a four, yeah. uh, two and a half, three, or even speech, they cannot you give them one. They cannot get that, right. that, that, that. You just give them the first. Mm -hmm. Or if, yeah. Yes, we, we know a range of kids. And, and really what will end up happening over time is do, if you give one chain instruction, is it going to ruin a kid forever? No. But if what happens over time is I want you to do these three things and I only get to one. So I did something, but mom comes back and says, you didn't do it right. You didn't do it. Or I didn't get it done again and I get attention for it. I didn't do it again. I get attention for it over time we might be training our kids to not follow through with all the instructions we give. Whereas in a different behavioral model, I give you a one-step direction, compliance happens, parent recognizes it. Compliance happens, parent recognizes it. Compliance happens, parent recognizes it. That happens 20 times, 40 times, 100 times. Pretty soon, we have successfully reinforced the likelihood of kids following directions. So oftentimes, they, this is a hard pill for some parents to swallow because they say, this is how my mom talked to me, or this is how everybody in the world talks to me, or this is just how I give instructions. And I recognize that. That's true. In and of itself, none of these are implicitly wrong or implicitly going to lead to noncompliance over time. What we need to help parents to realize is that it's not just the singular event, that it's this type of instruction multiplicatively that over time may lead to less and less compliance. And if our goal is to increase listening in kids and increase following directions, we have to set the stage for success. And these things just don't seem to set the stage for success as readily as others do. Um, question instructions. Those are things like, want to go clean your room? <laughs> yeah. And so that's, <laughs> that, you know, but again, it's, it's how a lot of parents ask questions. Yeah. Nope, don't want to. Or you want to hand me that dish? Nope, don't want to. So again, yes, sometimes kids know what the intent of their parent really is. But it leaves room for kids to be non-compliant, and it's not what parents want. Uh, repeated instructions. Those are grab your shoes, grab your shoes, grab them, grab your shoes, grab your shoes, get them again. They're right there, grab your shoes. Or giving the same command, rapid fire. What that does is sets up a tone of, of nagging in some ways, but it takes from the child the opportunity to have followed the direction. And over time, when we were looking at those models of coercive behavior, it was parent tells the child to do something, child doesn't do it. Parent tells the child to do something, child doesn't do it. Parent tells the child to do something, doesn't do it. Parent escalates their own behavior, then the child complies. 
that chain has happened multiple times and it can really lead to um, type of chain commands because the parent knows, oh, I got to tell them five times before they're going to do it anyway. So they start to take away the opportunity for the child to follow directions in the first place. From the, from the perspective of the broken record, mm -hmm. which sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's effective, mm -hmm. how do you distinguish well, later, mm -hmm. that the broken record thing from where we uh, repeated instructions? Yep. Broken record is really a strat, what she's making rec reference to is some kids like to engage in an argument and they want, seem to want to have the, the argument with the parents. And so parents have been instructed to be a broken record. It's time for you to pick up your shoes and take them upstairs. I don't want to take a I want you to pick up your shoes and take them upstairs. Blah, 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 blah. And it, it's a strategy for parents to stay neutral, calm, and just keep repeating their directions. The difference between a broken record and repeated instructions is not allowing the opportunity for the child to comply. So in some ways it's similar, but what we're teaching parents to do is not just to rapid fire, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, but to give your child a chance to do it so you can assess compliance and give attention to it. Yeah. Um, vague instructions are what they say, just not very clear about what it, behavior it is the child's to do. Or you know what you're supposed to do, go do, go do what I told you to do. Or you know how you need to behave. You know, again, we, we, we probably know what parents mean, and they know implicitly the behavior that's annoying them to say, you need to behave the right way. But for kids, if our intent is to set up compliance, we want to be explicitly clear with kids about this is the behavior I want to see out of you, not just turn your attitude around or show me what I want to see. Let's instructions. Um, those are like, let's go clean your room. Again, not overly terrible, but what let's is is the contraction of let us go do something. So let us go clean your room it implies that we're going to go do it together. Again, if it happens once, is it going to sink a child? No, but it's the repeated of if the child thinks that they're waiting for you to come do something with them, it's decreasing their compliance. So if we really mean you go clean your room, it's teaching parents to be explicit about you go clean your room. And then finally, instructions yelled from a distance, like, come down here, bring your laundry down from upstairs, or, or whatever the instruction is. Again, it's just the physical proximity. If, if there's a likelihood of the child not hearing, or not seeing, or assessing perhaps the urgency of the direction that's given, there's just less of a likelihood that they're going to follow through with it. So in this session, again, we're teaching parents about what constitutes a bad command or is less likely to elicit compliance from their kids, and then we'll be teaching them about what a good command is. All right, so then characteristics of a good instruction. States explicitly and directly what's to be done. It's a direct statement given only once and followed by 10 seconds of silence. Now, again, it, this is not an unrealistic. This is like if parents wait nine seconds, it's not that they failed to do it the right way, but it's legitimately giving kids a chance to respond and not just pick your shoes up, pick your shoes up, pick your shoes up, but it's, you know, pick your shoes up. And then saying, hey, great job, you started to put your shoes on, I really appreciate it, or, or you, you didn't follow my direction, I told you to put your, pick your shoes up. It's essentially giving a period of time for kids to respond or to start responding. Um, this keeps the instruction in the forefront of the child's attention and gives them the opportunity to comply. That's why we tell parents generally give 10 seconds to, to respond because there's no other noise to distract them. There's no other instruction or words happening to distract from what you told them to do and it gives them a chance to start complying. And then finally, this is what we, a question that's often given is, are parents allowed to say please? And really it's fine if parents want to follow or proceed their statement with a please to model manners. We just want to make sure that parents aren't doing it in a way that's begging, like please pick up your shoes, but please pick up your shoes. <laughs> yes. So these are the characteristics of a good command. Now, if a parent gives a good command, does it mean every time their child's going to listen to them? Absolutely not. Again, we're talking about conditional probability. You're trying to set the stage to get the best behavior that we can. And so what we know is if a parent gives a bad command, is their child going to automatically be non-compliant? No. 
they give a good command, will they be automatically compliant? No, but we're trying to set the stage for success, set the stage for compliance. Yes? What, what would you say about um, just being nice during it? For example, mm -hmm. um, hi, sweetie, but here's a knife. I, I really need you to put your shoes, please. Would that be appropriate, you know, kind of like being sweet or nice? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, um, let me ask the rest of you. Do you think that's appropriate for parents to be, like, sweet and nice in their re requests? <laughs> what? Depends on the kid. Depends on the age. Yeah, again, I think what might be tough, especially for some younger kids, is I want you to pick up your shoes, um, and I really want you to do it because it's, you know, this is something that you and I are working on, but like. term of endearment, like, I need you to pick up your shoes. Yeah. You know, something like that. I don't think it's ever, well, and you can disagree with me or let me know, but I don't think modeling affection for kids is ever really wrong. I think if parents are doing it in a way to try to manipulate compliance, it can go awry. But just as a general rule of thumb, I don't think it's it's wrong or, or bad or sets a poor tone to show affection to kids. Yeah. I think that I was just telling them, like, thinking about myself as a, mm -hmm. as a person, as, as a parent. Mm -hmm. If I'm normally sweet with my child, and mm -hmm. if I'm very different, they would, it, I think it'd be too different, they would look at you like almost like a stranger. You want to still be mom, mm -hmm. yeah. implementing it, and still maintain some of the characteristics of you, of you yeah. Than whatever, because I am also that way in a yeah. sense, and I think that I would probably yeah, stay that way. Yeah. yeah. Because if you're too different, mm -hmm. they may not get there. And I think the point, yeah, I think the point you're bringing up too is discrimination. We don't want to have cued discrimination of when to listen to mom versus when not to. So if, when I really mean it, I get like, mm, voice on and pick up your shoes versus the rest of the, rest of the time when it's like, hey baby, pick up your shoes. Um, we might be training our kids to respond to a different stimulus than we want them to. So yeah, we don't want parents to feel like they're losing the essence of them. Mm -hmm. yes, that's maybe then that's when you need to, if you started off this way and if it's still not complying, then you would maybe raise your voice or something different where they're, oh, she needs business. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in the bigger picture, what we want to start to teach kids over time, and I don't think this happens instantly, is that there's not a need to wait until I mean business. I mean business when I say anything. That, that's, it's business all the time. It's fun business, but it's business. <laughs> yeah. Right. This the other, only other thing that concerns me about mm -hmm. getting too sweet about it is mm -hmm. that there are children then that when they get to a school setting or another setting, they don't generalize that well. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't say please to me. Mm -hmm. you know, the teacher directs them to do that. Mm -hmm. didn't say please to me. I mean, you, know, you get those kind of things. Sure. Because they assume mm -hmm. that that's what's, and, and, and that can end up problematically. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and I think I, I I totally respect what you're saying, and I think what's good is that most people naturally have variability and are going to say please sometimes and not say please sometimes, um, or are going to be a little harsher sometimes and sweeter at other times within the framework of their general response style. And so I, I think the overall message here is teaching parents not that there's only one perfect way of saying a command but that they just need to be start, start to become aware of the ways they're giving instruction and that it might be setting up their child for less success. And that was that previous slide, the things that may set up a child for non-compliance rather than compliance. Behavioral rules are essentially the house rules or the things that parents or caregivers want to set up within the household that they don't want to have to give a command every time. So if running's not allowed in the house, you don't want to say stop running every single time running happens, but rather set it up as a house rule, something that's always in effect, always a rule. Or not stop fighting every time fighting occurs, but fighting is just never allowed in the household. So these are really the things that we don't want to have to give a command every time it happens. It's the general expectation of the household. Yes? I have a parent that they, they together with her children, have established the mm -hmm. house So mm -hmm. a lot of times if you have the you know, age school age kids that can mm -hmm. be, you know, not only the verbal mm -hmm. rules and reinforcement, but also having those rules written down. Yep. Or on the blackboard like on a blackboard or in the playroom or on the refrigerator or whatever. Yep. I agree with you. I think not only do we want to post them somewhere where kids can see them, but not just review them once, but review them 
repeatedly and make them with the kids so they're part of the engagement. And modifications for younger kids that can't read oftentimes are finding pictures of, you know, if you're supposed to sit at the dinner table, let's find a picture in a magazine of somebody sitting nicely at the dinner table and we'll have a visual cue of that. Um, for older children, they might not need visual cues and might think it's not very cool to have house rules, but even if they're not explicitly posted, though that's not a bad idea, reviewing them frequently so that there's no ambiguity or confusion about what the household expectations are. And again, a lot of parents are going to say, no, my kids know what the rules are. We already have household expectations, and that may very well be true. But it might also be true that they have expectations that their kids kind of get and again, just making a bit more formal and explicit will help to set the stage for rule-following behavior. It will not cause directly rule-following behavior, but in antecedents, we're trying to set the environment up for success or set the environment for rule-following behavior. Um, and then I think we've said here is the implication of behavior rules is that when they're violated, there's no warning given. Rather, there's usually an immediate consequence. The example here we're using is timeout, but for households, that immediate consequence is going to depend on what the parent thinks is appropriate, what you think is appropriate as a therapist guiding the parent, and what the parent can do right away. So what can be an immediate consequence? Um, what we're going to ask parents to do in the session is just to simply establish a set of behavior rules and begin to label the child's behavior every time they do it. So not necessarily following through with the timeout yet or the consequence yet, but starting to notice how frequently our house rules violated. Was my rule set comprehensive? And then starting to label it for the kids. Uh, one of our house rules is no running in the house, and you're running in the house right now. You're breaking a rule. Or whatever language they choose to use to convey that message, but getting them to start to identify that you're breaking a household expectation, or you're fighting with your brother that's not allowed in our house. That's a household rule. Yeah? Do you get it as part of this, um, you know, how to put a rule together? Because, you know, I find when I ask parents to put house rules together, often they're ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Or it's everything in the world. And yeah. Then kid, you know, and then they'd be in timeout all day long. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, there are directions in the manual, and we can go through that in more detail if you would like to after break. But yeah, there's more explicit direction in how to guide parents into it. And again, there are clearly definable, observable behaviors that are things that would warrant a consequence right away. If they're things that parents give frequent reminders about and wouldn't want to give a consequence right away, it's probably best it's not a house rule. So those are kind of the major, major overarching things. But yes, it is. there's more detail about that. The homework then is going to be continue using special time, using the attending and rewards, daily practice of good instructions, and really starting to notice is it um, starting to notice when they're using poor instructions and trying to modify it on the spot. So let's go clean your room. Go clean your room. Um, practice attending and then setting up those behavioral. So I'm going to pause. We'll come back and practice some of these after the break.